Brushless DC motors have become almost a marketing buzz term in so many products that the average consumer probably doesn't fully understand exactly what they are. But there's no doubt that they've changed the way we as engineers look at the mechanical side of our designs. As we consider how to get the most out of these motors in battery powered applications, what are the key considerations for our drive circuitry to maximize the effectiveness of this great technology? As the world moves more towards the electrification of all products and the decarbonization of things that we normally would consider being run by an engine, we're seeing things like drones, tools, lawn equipment, uh, certainly our vehicles with the electrification of vehicles, um, and then also robotics, really relying a lot more on brushless DC motors. That's a really exciting development for all of us, but as engineers, we've got to consider how do we actually maximize the efficiency of those systems? Um, and then beyond that, with so many of these, these systems no longer being attached to wall power, but being powered by batteries themselves, how do we get the most of the battery life out of these uh, motor systems um, and really maximize the efficiency of our circuitry? Today, I have the privilege of speaking with Tom Wolf, who's Senior Technical Applications Engineer at Nexperia and an expert in brushless DC motors. Tom, thanks so much for joining me on The Current today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, Todd. So, you know, I remember my first real experience with probably motors of any kind was as a kid growing up in the 80s. I had a, a, a TE little slot car set, and, and that was a brush DC motor. And I remember taking the cars mm -hmm. apart um, and seeing the little red winding in the middle of the two magnets spinning like crazy. And I'd hit the trigger on this little slot car on the, on the track, and that thing would just boom. I mean, the acceleration on it was absolutely incredible. Um, and that's, I think, the, the kind of motors that I, I really grew up with. But then, you know, in my design life, as I've moved into things, everything seems to certainly be moving the brushless direction. And we see that if you go to, you know, a Home Depot or a Lowe's and you're, you're buying tools, it seems like that's on the box, brushless DC motors. Um, and like I said in the opening, kind of almost a marketing buzz term. Can you talk to me a little bit about, one, why brushless DC motors have become so very popular today? Maybe some of the differences in that technology and, and why brushless seems to be winning. Hey, it's all about the power. We always need more power for every new application that comes along. I remember those slot cars as well, too. Really small. Remember the biggest thing, though, is that when you ran those things fast, they arced and sparked. Yeah. I mean, they created that ozone in the room after you ran them for a while as right. well, too. Problem is, as you scale up motors more and more, that arcing gets bigger and bigger. That's why brushless DC motors are around. They get rid of the arcing because they get rid of the yeah. brushes on them. So essentially what we've done is we've turned the motor inside out. Remember how that brush motor used to work. You have a permanent magnet on the outside of it, north and south poles. Inside of it, you've got an electromagnet, a series of them inside, and then a commutator, the little thing that the brushes rubs against. Mm -hmm. And as the motor turns, it switches the different electromagnet coils from north to south or south to north, which then push or repel and turn the rotor inside the stator. So that's how you get movement out of it. So it is called mechanical commutation. It is the placement of those actual brushes and that commutator that determines how fast the motor spins. Now, the problem is you get higher and higher power. It arcs more and more until the point where you're just going to blow it up. It's going to burn apart. Hence, the brushless DC motor. And you're right. It's kind of become a marketing term now. You go to the local tool market and says it's a brushless tool. Most people have no idea what that means, but it's new and improved and it's better. So a brushless DC motor essentially turns the motor inside out. Instead of having a permanent magnet on the outside and the electromagnet spinning inside of it, flip it around the other way. Spin the permanent magnet on the rotor inside and put the electromagnets on the outside of it. No brushes, no commutator on it. So now I can put as much current and as much voltage as I want into it, and it's all under control of digital commutation. It's not that little spinning commutator that it turns when each one turns north or south. It is electronic external circuitry. That is where the MOSFETs come in. I need something to quickly turn those MOSFETs off and on as the motor turns to turn a north pole into a south pole, south into a north pole, and actually cause it to rotate. Right, right. So, and, and that adds a level of complexity in the actual design process that wasn't there mm -hmm. in the old brush motors. But, you right. know, like you said, just so much more efficiency possible in that. Um, mm -hmm. So th then we've got to be very careful about how we choose those MOSFET components and what we're exactly. actually doing in that design. 
Right, because they're doing a huge amount of load. In a mechanically commutated brushed motor, it is actually the position, the relationship of the commutator to the magnet which determines it. Now I can change that. I can have the electricity start on electromagnet sooner. I can have it later. Instead of being all on or all off, I can slowly dim it on. I can turn it on slowly, turn it off slowly. I can reverse the motor. That's all software controlled now. So once right. you build the fundamental design <clears throat> where I take these six MOSFETs, because I've, in a typical brushless DC design, I have what's called a, a Y configuration. Three wires go into a brushless DC motor. Right. They're connected in a Y configuration. So when mm -hmm. I put power on any of the two wires, it's actually turning on two different electromagnets inside the device. One's north-south, one's south-north. So if I arrange them around the rotor, the permanent magnet rotor, in the right way, when I turn them on, it pulls it on one side of the motor and pushes it on the other side simultaneously, and then I just walk that pattern around it. So I need six very robust MOSFETs to drive these. And again, it's just how much power you want to push through it. I'm no longer limited by the mechanical commutator. I can throw as much power as I want, when I want, as fast as I want. It's now become a, a software. It's truly a digitally controlled motor. Right, right. And then you're getting into really doing a lot of, you know, how we actually maximize the efficiency in that in the code, mm -hmm. making sure you've got the right algorithms to actually spin that motor and, exactly. and change things mm -hmm. as you're accelerating the speed, uh, things along those lines. But the circuitry right. itself, outside of just adding a firmware element or software element to it, mm -hmm. you also have a little bit more complex circuit in, in actually driving those electromagnets. And we, yep. you know, you're talking about those FETs. What are the considerations mm -hmm. that we as engineers really need to put, you know, our, our primary focus? focus on when we're selecting those FETs. Okay. In your slot car, all you had to do was turn the motor, the electricity onto those two yep. wires, and it started yeah, it was spinning. Gone. Yeah. Exactly. It's gone. For a brushless DC motor, I need to very carefully control the wave shape going into those three coils that right. go into the motor itself. Six MOSFETs, and I can turn either one of those sets of coils north-south or south-north. So I need to pick MOSFETs that can drive as much voltage and as much current in a good thermal solution to drive that device. So let's not talk about the slot car here. There are a couple of brushless DC slot cars, by the way, but brush motors are still good enough. Right, let's talk right. about power tools, because that's where yeah. you really see the brushless word no out now. No doubt. So, so I typically have an 18 to 24 volt uh, battery pack on board, five lithium ion cells. But that uh, then gives me enough power that I can drive 20 volts at several hundred amps into the motor itself. So we're talking a thousand to a 2000 watt motor. That means very high currents for very short periods of time, and I need to get that heat out of those MOSFETs. Yep. So the reality of MOSFET design is you can do anything if you can get rid of the heat. I can put current all the way up to its maximum fusing current. That is when the wire frame of the MOSFET itself physically melts. But up to that, as long as I can get the voltage and the current through it and get the heat out, I can continue to drive it faster and faster. The real issue with brushless DC motors today now, and particularly like in power tools, is building a device that won't kill the operator. Because if you're running a drill into a hunk of concrete and you hit a rebar, that bit's going to stop turning instantly, which means you're going to start gonna spinning start on the other yeah, side of it. Right. So now your software needs to be able to accommodate both the mechanical reaction as well as the physical reaction to that. My current goes from 50 or 100 amps or whatever I'm running at to a peak of suddenly many hundreds of amps instantaneously. Yeah. My software has to detect that, hey, the rotor stopped turning, turn this thing off before the MOSFETs fry themselves, and then have some sort of nice recovery off of that. So, yeah, those all go into it. So I need a MOSFET which can handle the voltage I'm working with. If it's a 20-volt power pack, most common, then right. I need probably a 30-volt MOSFET, so I have some spikes for it. For the current, I need to look at the use model for it. The use of a drill versus the use of a router, for example, is different. Yeah. Is it running at high speed continually, or is it slowing down, is it stalling, are you, you know, a bunch of different applications. That tells me the current profile. How many amps do I need for how many seconds at a time? Because my software can control that. I can run extremely high power levels for very short periods of time or low power levels for long periods of time. My software needs to accommodate that. So I need the right voltage FET. I need a FET which has the maximum current capability of what my user profile is, and that will vary depending on the software and the specific application. And then ultimately I need a MOSFET which can get the heat out. It will always get hot. Running current through a MOSFET, no matter how low your RDS on is, will always create heat. I need a good package solution so that heat can quickly get from the inside the silicon, inside the package itself, to the outside, to the heat sink, usually to the frame of the drill or the tool itself, so I can dissipate the heat out of it. So that's yeah. what I'm looking for, voltage, 
current, and how do I get the temperature out? That's yep. what helps me pick my MOSFET. Yeah, yeah. No, no doubt about it. And, and you, you mentioned the RDS on and the fact that, mm-hmm. you know, the lower the RDS on is, the less heat that you're going to generate and the more efficient yep. in theory mm-hmm. the system could be. And, and certainly where we're seeing a lot of technology go these days in that arena is, you know, if I want the lowest possible RDS on, I've got to go silicon carbide, I've got to go GAN. Mm-hmm. Um, things yep. along those lines. That's becoming the real popular technology. Is that really where everything's going to go, or do you still see a place out there for, for power silicon FETs as well? Mm-hmm. It's a chase to zero. RDS on, the resistance between the drain and the source, how low can I get? Yep. The best parts now are about one half of one million, one half of one thousandth yeah. of one ohm. That gets you four or five hundred amps of current through a device, which is you would think that's enough. It's not enough. Somebody always wants more power than that. Right. So for the really high power levels, remember that the power delivered to a motor is the amps times the volt. It's the watts that go into it. Yep. If I can increase the voltage, I can decrease the current and still deliver the number of watts. That's where gallium nitride and silicon carbide come in for an a electric vehicle, for example. Right. If I'm running at 600 volts and one amp, that's 600 watts. That's a fair amount of power right yeah. there. If I put thousands of amps through at hundreds of volts, I can get, let's see, a Tesla model plate is something like 700,000 watts. I could run through it. It's 1,000 horsepower, 700,000 watts. Yeah. You don't do that at low voltages. Your MOSFETs would be so gigantic. The wire, the cables would be so gigantic for the amperage. So voltage goes up, current goes down. That's where gallium nitride and silicon carbide are going to fit in. They're not going to be in your slot car anytime though soon. That is not an application for them. And even power tools, you know, the efficiency is not there. But when I start getting into the hundreds of volts and the hundreds of amps, yep, silicon carbide and, and the new gallium nitride for the efficiency, that's really the way we're going to have to go. Right, right. And that's why we're seeing it so much in not just the mm-hmm. electric vehicles themselves, but I know at Future Electronics, we're working with so many customers on the recharge systems for electric vehicles, yep. and the, that's got to be a silicon carbide or a GAN solution. Uh, also, yep. you know, the other side uh, on clean energy generation and the, the solar mm-hmm. inverters that we work on, um, there you've got to go with something along those lines. But, it's you know, it's mm-hmm. interesting to see, you know, we're not quite there yet on the handheld tools um, and on some yep. of those lower voltage systems. Um, it'll be interesting to see if, if that continues to evolve as time goes on. I'm sure it will, as, as our industry mm-hmm. always sees. So, yep. you know, yep. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you really need the efficiency. All of those new electric vehicles and solar-powered systems, they're all about the efficiency. Yeah. When I charge my electric car, I don't want to throw away even 0.1% of my efficiency. I want everything out of it because the power levels are so high. Small yeah. applications, efficiency is not as bad. High power applications, oh yeah, you want that extra decimal point of efficiency that the GAN or silicon carbide will give you. It makes a huge percent, a huge difference in the wattage consumed, no doubt yep. about it. Mm-hmm. Very good, very good. So, so then with Nexperia, I mean, you've got a wide offering of products in this arena, to be sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot of you know suppliers that that also are, are have the same kind of products. From the Nexperia point of view, and in what you guys have on on your portfolio, where do you guys see that you've really got the strengths here, and, and why should an engineer be considering Nexperia above the other options that are out there on the market? Nexperia is one of the highest volume semiconductor manufacturers on the planet. Yeah. That's not just bragging. What that means is that you need to have the highest reliability. If you have one part per million and you built, let's see, we did 100 billion devices last year, that's hundreds of thousands of failures in the field. You don't stay in business. So everything we built is built for reliability. About 80% of our devices are automotive plus rated. In other words, they beat, meet or exceed all of the automotive specifications. So we're building for the hard cases, the really tough, reliable ones. That's where our parts are built. So everything we have from our regular silicon superjunction MOSFETs that you'd find in power tools, for example, yeah. are built for the absolute worst conditions, the best packaging, for the best thermal, with the best silicon inside them to handle those high temperatures and high loads and high currents. We have 5 by 6 millimeter MOSFETs that can flow 300 plus amps. An 8x8 can flow 500-plus amps. Except remember how small these are. That's the size of a fingernail. Huge amounts of current go through these packages. But we're adding on as well, too, because silicon MOSFETs for low voltage just aren't enough for anything anymore. So we've recently added gallium nitride FETs. HEMPS is the technical term for them. To get us in that 600 to 800 volt range for electric vehicles and chargers and applications like that. But the same rules. The ultimate reliable package, the ultimate reliable silicon inside, everything fully automotive rated plus to handle pretty much anything you can throw at it. And the future's got more stuff, too. We've already introduced silicon carbide diodes. 
yeah. silicon carbide FETs are just behind it for those really, really high power applications where even GAN can't cut it. And at the low end, IGBTs, which are, you know, man, 30, 40 year old technology, but for DC voltages, for very high current levels, you can't beat an IGBT. <clears throat> The idea is that from Nexperia, if you need a switching device, I don't care what the voltage is, what the power is, what the current, what the package is, we want you to be able to come one place and get anything you need from the smallest to the biggest FETs that are out there. Right, right. And then certainly, you know, just kind of follow-up question to that. I mean, we're certainly in a market where, um, you know, things are a little dicey. We're not sure what's going to happen in, in the semiconductor market or the global economy mm-hmm. or everything over the next couple of quarters. Uh, but, you know, it, what certainly seems to be the case is that demand for these types mm-hmm. of products, the demand for power FETs, whether okay. they be traditional silicon or moving to the silicon carbide or the gallium nitride, you know, that's not going to go anywhere. It's only going to continue to right. increase. Um, yeah. How are you guys seeing as far as allocation, lead times, things along those lines? How are you guys ramping up to be able to handle that additional demand that I think is going to stay in the market for the foreseeable future? Yep. The, the problem with adding a capability and industrial capacity for a fab is that Fabs are expensive and take a long time to build. Yeah. We actually were lucky. We started our newest fab uh, located in Shanghai, China. It's our first 12-inch wafer fab. We started it before the COVID pandemic. Uh, the building is about done. Now it's time to equip it, start, run, start running the first wafers on it. So you still got a year or two till that, part starts, till that factory starts really building the parts that you need. But that is where the MOSFETs will really come into their own because those are large wafers. MOSFETs are gigantic die sizes. That'll be where we hopefully can finally catch up with the MOSFET demand that's out there. Because like you said, MOSFETs are showing up at everything. Brushless is the word, whether it's your power tool, it's your garden tool, even your hair dryer. I mean, they're all digitally controlled now. The MOSFET demand is only going to go up. So we have a large facility which is located in Manchester, England, one in Newport in uh, Wales, and then the new one in Shango. Those will all be building MOSFETs to try to keep up with this new future demand, which, like I said, is only going to grow. Yeah, yeah, it's it's going to be crazy to watch and exciting. Um, although yeah. I know it's causing all of us a lot of headaches right <laughs> now, headache, trying yeah. to make sure we can actually meet the demand and keep our uh, you know our customer engineers building the product that they've done, put so much work into designing. Um, yeah. So hopefully we can uh, we can see some of those lead times shrink a little bit as more capacity from Nexperi and others continue to come online. Um, uh, exactly. It seems to be what the world really needs right now. Mm-hmm. So, well, Tom, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This was very, very insightful. And, and I think, you know, motor control, motor technology just in general is an area that, that all of us, if we haven't done it before, and I think most of us as electrical engineers have at some point in our design career, mm-hmm. it's something that all of us are going to have to get better and better at. Yep. Um, as, mm-hmm. again, we see the carbonization of everything, the automation of everything, um, mm-hmm. you know, those motors are going to be very, very critical for everything that we're doing. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise exactly. in this area. I know we're just scratching the surface surface of all that mm-hmm. can be discussed in this, uh, but we'll, I, I hope we can do that in further follow-up conversations down the road. Um, exactly. Thanks so much to our audience for joining us on The Current. Uh, we're excited to kick off Season 3, um, and uh, you hope you'll join us uh, for our third season of this series. Uh, really appreciate your continued viewing. If you have designs that you're working on, whether those be in motor control where you need some help deciding on power fets um, or, or anything else, we would love to have our engineers at Future Electronics and all of our great suppliers like Nexperia um, there to help you out, bring you the support that you need, and get you successful as fast as possible to get to market as fast as possible. Please feel free to reach out to us at Shaping the Future, one word, Shaping the Future, at futureelectronics.com. We'll hook you up with some of our local engineers around the world, get you in touch with, uh, with engineers that are suppliers like Tom, um, and get you up and running. Um, so thanks so much for joining us. Look forward to spending more time with you in season, season three of The Current, and we'll see you next time.